Hey, Matt. How you doing? Life is grand. How are you? <laughs> also doing grand. Uh, pretty swell mm. on my end. <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, salutations from the entire Pro Sound Effects community and everybody watching. Pleasure to be here. Hope I can be of service. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I was just uh, going through here demonstrating a lot of the the beautiful textures and variety from the the rain library that you've mm. released within Core Five, and you know I was just kind of uh, hopefully not speaking for you, but speaking to the uh, to the what's what's beautiful about rain and having a, a collection like this is that there's so much like specificity with different layers and mediums against which. Uh, the rain falls, and so if you're looking at a scene, you can really create some some specified layers and create an immersive soundscape. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, the quality and variety that you've got within this library is pretty amazing. Thanks. Uh, I'm glad you hear that. It was kind of a dream come true. I was I recorded most of the rains while I was doing Blade Runner 2049, which takes place a lot in there, there's a lot of wet environments. And Southern California would have a once in a generation or two <laughs> that February, these amazing storms. And I committed myself to going out every night and weekend capturing to capture as many surfaces and intensities as I possibly could. Right. Um, and uh, and I like that you use this, I, this term specificity because um, part of my motivation was to get recordings of rains that didn't sound like what I had in my library heretofore, which were, you know, rain is kind of noise based. It doesn't have tonality or pitch and it tends to kind of mush and turn into white noise. And uh, the, the secret to good rain is the right surface um, with the right microphone, with the, 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 the right perspective so that you feel wetness. I think if you're going to do rain, it should feel wet as much as you feel the nature of the surface, be it um, concrete, asphalt, uh, you know, window, roof, uh, you know, on and on and on and on. Yeah. And um, also to, 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 the, to the same point, um, you spoke of layers, but all of these are raw recordings. I mean, raw right. in that I didn't layer these and design them. These are right off the recorder, sometimes with a little bit of high pass to get rid of city rumble because I'm in, the, in a big city and you want mm -hmm. pristine rain. So, you know, I cut out 40 cycles or something like that and I'd trim off my voice slates, but otherwise they're just as I recorded them. Right, so it's more source material as opposed to like designed uh, rain, like immersive sound effects. Uh, but yeah, I was more referring to the, this idea that, you know, you had of like sort of this, uh, you know, this idea of being able to take your raw sources and to then, you know, bring different files within the Pro Tools. So if we've got, you know, if we're looking at a frame of a scene and we've got cars over to the left that are close and are being rained on, and then there's mm. a tree on the right, and mm. then maybe we've got, you know, whatever that we know we have behind us, behind the, the viewer, it's like we can bring these individual layers, whether in mono or stereo, and, and sort of pan them and aim them and yeah. create a sonic... Yeah. you know, soundscape with these varied textures. And, mm. and like you said, what's so nice about these recordings is as opposed to having very diffuse kind of white noise, there's like a, a granular uh, clarity quality to them mm. of hearing the individual drops and the tonalities that, that come out of that. So Thank it's, it's an excellent library and I'm really excited to uh, be using it in my own productions as well. Uh, th thanks. Um, the specificity was something I was after. And, you know, yeah. you, as you mentioned, it, you could have a scene with a car on the right and a tree on the left and a driveway in the middle. And you'd want rain on those different textures. And I do this all the time, though many of those recordings are immersive. They're 7.0 or 5.0 or four or quads. Mm -hmm. I, I'll pick a mono leg and I'll right. just take a mono leg of an immersive sound. I'll stick it over in the left because it's rain on tree and you can pan it and move it around in the mix very nicely. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. So uh, I want to talk about some of your other libraries that you've given us uh, within this new Core 5 bundle. Uh, we just did a giveaway. Uh, Trinity Jackson just won a copy of your Tortured Memories library. Oh, congratulations. Uh, and then there's, uh, you've also brought us Kinetic and Data, or do you pronounce it Data? With, what's your uh, what's your stance I, on data? Data. Let me hold on. Uh, if you give me a sentence, uh, I'll have to say it in English. Uh, uh, the data. I say data. 
Okay. That doesn't All make right. it right. That doesn't okay. make it correct. <laughs> That's okay. It's, it's it's like the classic discussion of law versus lav. Yeah, oh, okay. um, yeah. So so uh, yeah. For I'm I'm just curious. Like when you're when you're going to create a library like kinetic or tortured memories or data. Uh, what's what's the genesis of the idea for you? How, how how do you how does it occur? Do you wake up one day and you go like, I just really feel like playing around with a synthesizer to create data sounds today, or using EMF mics, or mm. is it or does it arise out of a need from a particular project where you need a bespoke set of textures and tones uh, for that? Well, it, it's a little bit of both. Um, with tortured memories, that was a fun one because it started out with being inspired by the kinds of sounds I was getting from musical instruments that I was using to make acoustic source material for science fiction things mm. in Blade Runner and in Dune. And uh, musical instruments are always a go-to to me for source textures because they're rich and often melodic or harmonic and pitched and often those make the most recognizable sounds, hence something that feels more like a signature sound. Mm. And as I was between projects, I was looking back on some of those experiments and I thought, well, rather than just beating up on my sousaphone or my didgeridoo for one thing, why don't I just pursue this to some kind of logical conclusion? Mm. So um, I decided I would record a fresh pass of many instruments in my home. And I have a lot. Um, my son is a very gifted uh, film composer and he and I collect instruments. And so I thought, well, let's just start recording these in ways that you wouldn't record for a session for a music cue. Let's right. think of sound and sound design first, mic them in ways that, that, that um, um, best shows that off and then find some other nice tools to modify them and uh, see what we come up with. And that's how Tortured Memories came about is I started hearing all these emotive sounds when I started slowing down and adding reverb or adding delay. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very simple when it comes to processing. I, I don't often have very complex um, plug-in cocktails it, you know, it starts with a really unique sound that if maybe even if you heard the raws, you might not know what they were. Mm -hmm. And then just with a little light touch of some reverb to put them in a 7.0 space. Now you have something that feels like it's it's telling you something it's communicating to you some some longing for some something you can't quite get your hands on. Right. Um, so that was where tortured memories came from just. It, it all happened in the, in the course of about four weeks. I recorded about 30 instruments and then just started picking through them, finding the performances I loved and then seeing what I could do to tear them up. Yeah, I love I love this idea of using instruments in non-traditional ways and creating uh, maybe uh, like unpredictable sounds out of them and then and then grabbing because because like you said they are rich in tonality and harmonics and those overtones are designed into them mm. uh, in order to create musical notes that we yeah. recognize within a, a score but yeah. uh you know playing them in untraditional ways to create other varied <laughs> textures is a really fun approach because sorry go ahead Oh, that's all right. I, I was just going to say the, the 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 part part of the uh, utility of that as well is that as as we know is like you know when we work on movies that tend to have these either big action sequences or there's big score happening, uh, you know it can when you're adding just more noise content based sound into the mix, it can mm. tend to just either not appear at all through the mix or it can just add more mud yeah. and take up some of the headroom and real estate that you've got available to you. So when you're using these really tonal elements, they, right. they tend to poke through the mix in a way where they become sonically visible yeah. uh, to, the, to the listener. That's a great expression, sonically visible. <laughs> I have to use that in the future. <laughs> in, uh, in, inspired by the many ways in which yeah. you uh, describe sound. You know, it's. It, you, I just had a little laugh because I'm thinking as a guitarist, and I still record and make songs and, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're in the studio, 
when you're playing guitar, I always use round wound strings uh, and guitarists are always trying to get rid of the scritch. You know, when right. you move up and down the fretboard, you get that zee, zee, mm -hmm. zee. And I targeted that. <laughs> that was one of the many textures for Tortured Memories was sliding my calloused fingers up and down the strings to get these kind of metallic uh, zuzes, as it were. Right. And so I, I got my revenge. Yeah, I love that. So, so I'm, I'm curious to uh, ask you about your your data library. Um, I'm curious, uh, you know, we've uh, thus far we've been talking about recording uh, organic sources. You know, mm. when, when I say organic, I just mean sort of quote unquote real life sounds. You've been you know putting a microphone to a source and recording that object and then manipulating yeah. it in post. I'm yeah. curious for a library like data, uh, do you have any like real source recordings that you then manipulated into electronic sounds or what were you starting from a place of synthesis or a, or a combination of both? No, um, I, I, I'll, I'll say it out loud. I'm the world's worst synthesis. And, and um, I, I, I dedicated myself to avoiding them to this very day. I mean, okay. I have synthesizers, but I loathe having to go to them because, okay. because I'm not facile. I find that the two hours it takes me to twiddle enough knobs to figure out what I want to get out of it is better spent recording an acoustic sound that's very close to it mm -hmm. and then uh, processing it somehow with a group of plugins that I know a little bit better. Um, that being said, uh, none of the data sounds or data sounds are synthetically generated. They are all actual real-time recordings uh, from hard drives and electronic devices that I'm miking in a variety of ways to, to extract those sounds uh, because um, our ear can't pick them up in, in our, the traditional way of listening. Right. Are you using EM? Are you talking about using EMF mics? EMF mics and contact mics and suction cup mics and even regular rolled over the air microphones. You get something close enough, and you right. might even get an interference pattern that you would mm. normally shun when right. you were recording a door close or a dog bark. But now that interference sounds pretty tasty when you want it. Yeah, I, I, I love this idea of using uh, organic source material in order to create electronic representations of something like data or, or like, you know, UI that we might see in a movie. Because mm. um, one of the I mean, I, I, I personally find synthesizers to be very useful. But one of the I didn't mean to throw shade on synths. I'm simply reflecting on my own lack of skills. <laughs> oh, not not at all. No, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's part of one of the other things I enjoy about our craft is that each of us may approach the same problem in a variety of different yeah. ways and use so many different tools to get to, you know, achieving the same end result in the sense that it's, you know, telling the story that we need it to for the film or the narrative. Um, yeah. But but I, I was simply going to say that, um, you know, synthesizers, like one of the downfalls of them is that they do tend to create exact replicating sounds by the nature of how they're mm. put together. And of course, there mm. are parameters you can modulate randomly. But in general, for creating something like data, like you, you hit a note on a, on a synthesizer or a keyboard, and it generates the same sound over and over and over mm. again in cycles. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're starting with an organic source, there is no one perfect right. repetition over and over and over mm. again. There's always some level of uh, variation in there. And right. so you end up with more interesting, varied textures when they're coming yeah. from a place of uh, original source recordings. That's such a great observation. And there's deep um, biological and psychological and uh, physiological reasons why that is true and why I lean in more to organic uh, acoustic sounds because of all of that, those embedded cues in acoustic sound that, you know, time arrival and, and all, all the other um, attributes of acoustic sound that tell your brain this is real. Um, uh, synthetic sounds lack most of those cues. Um, hmm. And uh, therefore, it's, it's just harder to, to, to imbue them with those attributes to make it feel, yeah, I believe that thing. It doesn't sound like something from a 50s Flash Gordon movie. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. 
Uh, I'm just curious. So, um, like one of the questions I, I was just talking to, uh, Chris Diabold and Randy Torres, uh, uh, before you came on. And like one of the questions I was asking them is, um, like a, a brief discussion we had was, you know, as, as much as we would love to, as much as I would love to, at least we don't always have the time and resources to record every sound <laughs> fresh and bespoke for every yeah. project that we're going to do. Let me po apologize in advance. Now continue on with your statement. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, we don't always get to record fresh bespoke material for every mm. new project that we're on, or mm. at least not to cover the entirety of, of the project. You know, we may have to pick and choose, you know, the specific things that we want to record. Um, so that being said, uh, you know, all of us are sort of at some point beholden to using commercially available libraries. Mm. Uh, but you know, one of the amazing things about the pro sound effects collections and the core five collection, which you've contributed a pretty vast amount of sounds to, mm. uh, is that, you know, we get to have the hours that other designers and, and recordists have spent recording material and then have it readily available to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious what you think the utility in having like a general library like that is. And, and also when you're going to make a library purchase, what is it that you're looking for or hope to find uh, once you do so? Oh boy, two great questions. Let, let, let me break that down. The first question was, um, what is the utility of a library? Yeah, the, the utility. So like one of the, the benefits of, a, of the core five series is that there's a bunch of really specific targeted libraries within, mm, uh, such as like your rain library is an mm. example of a very specific mm. Uh, mm. niche mm. within the sounds that we need. And then there's mm. the, the sort of like scope of the general library. What yeah, utility vast. do you find in a general library like that? Well, huge. I, you know, as you know, I advocate for bespoke recording only insofar as, or it, my intention is really to just um, proselytize the idea of the importance of fresh ingredients, which is not to say that not only can I not record everything bespoke on any given project, I don't know anybody that can. I, I, I'll never work on the film where there's enough budget for me to record every sound anew. Right for the movie and so it would we, take forever too <laughs> how, what a horrible job that would be right. <laughs> working forever recording all new sounds for a project uh I'll, I'll, i won't hold my breath and so uh, we all rely on sound libraries and there's 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 uh, a great deal of joy in doing that when you know you have good material hmm. um to fall back on um so I use sound libraries and I continue to buy modern sound libraries uh, because they're so good. There's so many people now clued and cued into the value of fresh original recordings at higher sample rates in, and in immersive arrays. It, there's just so much good stuff out there. No one ever has to really feel ashamed about going to a library anymore. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, quite honestly, there, there's a kind of, cost benefit analysis that even I have to contemplate when starting on a project, which is, I know I've only got X weeks or months to work on a project. Are my talents and uh, is my time better spent trying to record an aircraft carrier because I don't have a good aircraft carrier? Or am I, is my time better spent designing something that right. needs more of my unique skills. Uh, and I, I, I make those, those decisions every day. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a, a great case to be made for. What is, how best is your time spent? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, so, yeah, and then the second part of that uh, question uh, was, you know, when you go to make a new library purchase, what sort of, What's, what are you hope, like, what's, what's the best case scenario when you download that library and unpack it? Cause you know, we're not always necessarily sure of what we're going to find, uh, uh, you know, when we open up a, a brand new library <laughs> that we've just purchased, I'm curious, uh, mm. what, you know, mm. what delights you in, in opening a new library? It's utility. I'm usually I've targeted something that I couldn't have recorded or I couldn't afford to record, you know, God bless those who are out recording tanks and vehicles and, and aircraft that are very expensive to, to get a hold of. And uh, they haven't been on my plate in a while. 
I, I've done them on specific films and they were made available to the production. But um, uh, it's just great to have something that's wonderfully recorded. Now, I'm, I'm looking for a narrative film aesthetic. There's a, there's, there's a number of ways to record sound. And I think the value of my contributions to the ProSoundFX library and the, the contributions that others make to commercially ava available libraries are an approach that allows you to take a sound right from the download and put it in your timeline without a lot of fussing around. And mm. it just drops in. I mean, you're always going to have to cut a car in and stop and make sure the turn off is in the right place. Nothing will ever drop right in, but there's a way of miking that and there's a way of mastering it that just makes those sounds super useful versus yeah. say, the, the, the capture for scientific purposes would be a very, very different approach hmm. to sound recording. So I'm looking for libraries that have a kind of media related or storytelling related uh, aesthetic in the, the creation of those libraries. Um, yeah. I'll tell you, you know, maybe more importantly to me personally is what I hope I don't get. The libraries that I don't like, and these are libraries that are super useful, I know, for other disciplines like gaming, for example. I don't like needless iterations. If there's mm -hmm. a, a laser shot, I want six great examples of it in one file so I can pick right. the one I like and drop it in my timeline and it's easy to put it into Pro Tools and boom, I'm on to the next sound. What I, I don't like is 50 one shots. And right. it, it, it muddies up my browser. It, it exhausts me when I have to search for them. So I'm also looking for metadata related um, utility uh, on top of the, the actual audio recording and its fidelity. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just talking to uh, Chris and Randy about uh, the similar subject along the lines of uh, metadata, and we hadn't talked about concatenated versus individual mm. sound files, yeah. but... But yeah, this idea of metadata, like one of the things that I th I'm like impressed and also happy about with Pro Sound Effects is that they managed to retroactively bring their entire library collection up to speed uh, to be compliant with the UCS yeah. system. That's a big job. Oh my it's God, a, a million files. Job. I'm in the I'm middle not... of doing it with my newer libraries and it just takes forever. But it's yeah, it does. <laughs> it's an un it's an undertaking for sure. Um, but you know, like Randy mentioned, and I think it's true, is that we spend such an enormous time, at least as sound editors, maybe less so on the sound design side. But when when we're sound editing for a film, like we spend a very large chunk of our time just searching for sounds. Mm. Mm. And like one of the problems with you know, and I understand it's it's uh, you know it's helpful for the game for the gaming people and their workflow to have individual one shots. But when you have, mm -hmm. you know, 50 individual files of a gunshot, like how varied is that metadata going to be exactly. for you to be able to tell like yeah. which of those 50 gunshots you need versus just clicking through one concatenated file. Right. Um, but the, the UCS <laughs> category system, I think is made searching for our sounds and what we're looking for much more efficient, um, which is, and which ultimately, you know, more time means we get to be more creative. The less time true. I spend looking for something, the more time we can so spend true. addressing whatever it is that we need to be addressing so within true. the context I, of the film. There, there's such an art form to good metadata. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to lastly, we've touched on all your other libraries and we've got just, just a couple minutes left. I was wondering if you could just briefly talk to us about your thought process behind Kinetic. Um, as I remember, uh, I have this co ongoing conversation with my good friend, Ezra Dweck, who's a well-known mixer and sound editor and field recordist. And we lament, we have been lamenting for 40 years, how hard it is to find just the right whooshes. <laughs> whooshes and swooshes are, are like a, 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 a um, Mariana's Trench. <laughs> I can never crawl out of when I go in because I have, you know, 67,000 of them and the 100%. metadata all needs cleaning up and you, it, finding a good whoosh 
it's just tough. So I, is I just whoosh 17 is your favorite, like whoosh 242. <laughs> I wish it were even that simple because the, the, the description fields and the category fields and the subcategory fields are still not all cleaned up in my library. And right. I, I can never, I can just, I just, you know, my eyes glaze over when I type in fast whoosh uh lfe or something like that and very I get... thick whoosh yeah you're right but I, and I'm thousand results yeah and there's probably a great airy thick whoosh that didn't get described that way so you still have to totally. listen to these these two thousand things so this was just my way of trying to make my job a little easier maybe for others as well yeah there, there's definitely something i there's there's something to that when when there's these sort of common search terms and uh one one useful thing I've tried to do recently is to try to build playlists where if I know it's always going to be annoying to find that type of thunderclap that I need. Like I don't, you know, if I, there, there's rolling thunder, there's thunderclap. Sometimes right. it's described as lightning in the library. It's like, so mm -hmm. I'll spend 20 or 30 minutes just getting the type that I know in my mind that I mean when I say thunderclap ah. and making a playlist mm. and same thing for whooshes and doors and oh doors what a... so on and so forth we don't need to have we could have a, an hour-long discussion <laughs> about doors but, oh my but uh but anyways uh, uh mark i just wanted to say thank you for your contributions to the whole sound community through these releases with uh, the core five collection from pro sound effects uh you know everything that they've managed to curate of yours has been extremely useful i mean I, I can't remember a production i've worked on for the past several years now where something from odyssey or one of your other uh, <laughs> specified libraries hasn't made it in um, you know, and the, the metadata that they've done is partially responsible for that because when I type in what it is I'm looking for, it, it's, you know, that stuff rises to the top is because it's so descriptive. So, yeah, great. Uh, I'm glad thanks for, that. thanks, thanks for coming on and for speaking with us and giving us a little insight into, into your process and how you think about this stuff. So, uh, it was a, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you, Matt. It's a distinct pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. See you Cheers. Soon.